Uh, my name is Jason Williams. I'm from Halifax, plastic surgeon out here, and I'm going to moderate this evening's panel. Uh, this panel is about preventative mastectomy and reconstruction in the high-risk patient. And we have a great panel of uh, folks to discuss this topic for you all this evening. And I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. And we will start with you, Aletta. Hi, uh, my name is Aletta Pohl. I'm a genetic counselor working at Women's College Hospital in Toronto. I've been working for over 20 years in the field of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, seeing either women who have breast cancer or perhaps um, women who have a strong family history of breast or ovary cancer. And I see them for genetic testing um, and recommendations around management when we find something on the test. Great, and Dr. LeBlanc. Uh, yes, hi, my name is Marty LeBlanc. I'm the plastic surgeon. I'm from the East Coast. I work in Halifax. Um, big part of my practice is breast reconstruction. I see a lot of patients with uh, genetic uh, risk uh, that go on to have reconstruction. So it's a, a big part of what I do and uh, happy to be here tonight. Thanks. Thank you, and Dr. Wheelock. Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm uh, like Dr. LeBlanc, I'm based in Halifax and uh, majority of my practice, my adult practice is uh, breast reconstruction. And I also do a lot of um, women with uh, genetic predispositions and sometimes even families. So we'll have women, you know, multiple women from the same family. Um, my, I guess my disclosure is that I enjoy doing all of the main types of breast reconstruction that we're done tonight, same as I get, think everyone else in the panel, and um, look forward to chatting about them. Excellent, excellent. So you've got a lot of East Coasters here tonight, and Alada, which is pretty close to the East Coast, isn't it? Used to be closer when we could fly easily. But anyway, <laughs> uh, good. So the plan this evening is uh, I'm going to, uh, moderate and throw some questions at our panelists uh, that hopefully are of interest to the audience and we'll have a friendly discussion and I'll encourage the audience um, participants to use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen uh, and I'll be able to see any questions that you put up there. Uh, if it's something we're going to cover or, or, or have covered I, I may skip it but uh, if there's um, something that's of interest to the general uh, audience will definitely bring it up and um, try to address that for you. So we've got about 40, 45 minutes or so. So let's jump right in. So I'm going to start with a question for you, Aletta. Uh, who uh, do you think should get genetic testing? So this is all one of the and actually it is a bit of a changing field when it comes to genetic testing. But in general, it can be considered certain um, women who obviously have breast cancer, uh, but not all women with breast cancer necessarily need testing. Breast cancer is a very common cancer. One in eight women get it. And a lot of those women don't get it because of anything hereditary. But there are sort of signs that can indicate that perhaps it could be due to a um, genetic predisposition. If you have more people with breast cancer in the family and you have to look at both your mom's side and your dad's side uh, because it can be inherited from either side so if you see multiple individuals if the breast cancers tend to happen at younger ages like in the 20s 30s 40s that can be a bit of an indication that it could be hereditary and then if we see also other kinds of cancers that can sometimes go with the same genes so if we see breast or ovary in the same family those are cases. And then more recently, we're also looking a little bit into the type of breast cancer people have. So if they have a certain kind of breast cancer called a triple negative breast cancer, it's a little more likely to be hereditary than the more standard ERP or positive HER2 negative breast cancer. So those are some of the kinds of people that you may want to look at. Um, also, it can be healthy people who have a strong family history of those things. That can also be relevant, though it's usually the best to start testing with someone with cancer, ideally, if you can, in the family. Great. Uh, in your experience, and I know your, your focus is on the center where you work, is there a long wait uh, for this kind of testing for women that are interested or eligible? 
it's not as long as in some, it changes a lot depending on where you're seen across the country. Um, Genex mm -hmm. clinics, unfortunately, different have, uh, different clinics have different capacity to deal with this. In the GTA, the, the Greater Toronto Area, we are actually quite fortunate that people usually can be seen in a relatively short time. Um, certainly, recently diagnosed breast cancer, breast cancer patients are prioritized here and they usually get seen quite quickly. I'm also, um, as a little aside, am working on a study um, where we rapidly test women just diagnosed on breast biopsy um, very quickly and we turn around test results in a week. Oh. And the testing is free for the patients that are eligible for the study. So we're trying to get this information quickly to people because it can help inform the best kind of surgery that they may need. Um, but certainly the wait times are different. I know, I think on the East Coast, you have a longer wait time in general for this. I think um, so. There's other provinces where that is the case as well. Great. You mentioned one thing that uh, caught my attention um, about it being free. Is there a cost for genetic testing usually? It depends on your situation. Um, so each province has its own criteria over who the province will pay for the testing. They are fairly similar across the country, but they're not quite the same. Usually if you, you're very young with a breast cancer, you can usually get testing paid for by the province. Otherwise you might need more family history. Um, but now it is possible to pay for testing yourself if you don't meet the provincial eligibility criteria and it's become much more affordable. Uh, sort of around 250 US dollars. There's a couple of places that you can actually get it yourself so that if you don't meet criteria or you just want it sooner, it is now an option to pay for testing. Okay. I'm going to throw one of the audience questions at you right now. Uh, it's a couple have come in. Do you see many cases where there's a family history of breast cancer in multiple family members, but there's no genetic disposition? And, and I think this leads into the types of um, genetic mutations as well, if you want to uh, yeah. segue so, into that. Um, testing has also really evolved a lot over the time I've been working. For the longest time, we were just testing people for two main genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2. But now um, there's been a big technology change that has allowed us to test people for more hereditary cancer genes, um, specifically more hereditary breast and ovarian cancer genes we're typically looking at in these families. Um, so in terms of to answer the question, Unfortunately, yes, we absolutely still see families that look really hereditary and we're sure there's something, but we test a whole huge panel of genes and we still don't find anything. So we definitely run into that, but we are also finding cases from before that had just say BRCA1 and 2 testing that maybe they don't have BRCA1 and 2, but they do have a POLB2 mutation or an ATM mutation. So if people had testing a while ago and not that long ago, <laughs> like maybe even two or th like three or four years ago before 2017, they may have just been tested for BRCA1 and 2 and they can get updated panel testing. Great. Um, one last specific area for you, Alette, if you don't mind. Um, so if someone does test positive for BRCA1 or 2, what would the risks of developing cancer be for those folks? So it is a little dependent on the age and a little bit on the family history, but in any case, a woman who has a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, her breast cancer risk is substantially increased over the population level. Usually if it's a young woman, it could be up to around 70% chance that she'll get breast cancer before age 80. Um, now, if I see a woman who has a mutation who's already 70, I'm not going to tell her that 70% risk because she would have lived through most of that genetic risk. But for a young person, definitely the risk is around 10 times the population level, um, very significant increase. And it can be worth considering risk reducing measures like uh, risk reducing mastectomy or bilateral mastectomy. Perfect. Because I was just going to ask you, what is the risk reduced to approximately if someone was to undergo bilateral risk reducing mastectomy? It's certainly over 90%. But we follow the, um, I work with Dr. Stephen Nairod, who's a very um, well known, renowned uh, 
doctor who works in the field of hereditary breast cancer doing studies on this. And we found, we followed, he has a very large database of women who carry either BRCA1 or 2 mutations. And we follow these women and see what they choose to do and what works and what doesn't work. And when we followed all these, like we have, a, I think, almost 20,000 women now that we're following, we find that it does reduce the risk very significantly. It doesn't go to zero. Unfortunately, no matter what you do, you're left with a little bit of residual breast tissue. And so there's a little bit of risk left. But it's probably realistically, depending on the type of surgery, around 97%. It's most of the risk goes. Excellent. Okay, so so that sort of sets the scene for this uh, issue, which is that um, uh, BRCA1 and 2, at least, patients are at extremely high risk of developing cancer. Uh, we're detecting a lot of the, te we're testing a lot of these folks, we're detecting a lot of them, and risk-reducing mastectomy is effective. So, a lot of these folks are probably young and interested in reconstruction. So, um, Dr. Wheelock, can I ask you, when you see a patient of this, in this, um, uh, um, with this diagnosis and who's interested in reconstruction after bilateral prophylactic mastectomies, how is your consultation different than for someone that has cancer already? Oh, shoot, yeah, it's, um, I, I think it's, it's a little tough. I think it, with any patient I see, my general goal is to really try and find the, the right fit of, um, of procedure for, for the woman. And it depends a bit on the surgeries that they will have, um, if, you know, for, and whether they would need radiation or not. And then also their family life. So can you take time off work? Can you not? Um, a lot of women who have the, you know, BRCA positive genes are younger. Um, so they may have younger families. And I find that sometimes it's harder for them to have the big recovery from a, a DIP flap. So, um, so I, personally, and I think, I, I think probably most surgeons try and get a sense of, of where that woman is, what her overall goals are and, um, her supports and um, and go from there for surgery. You know, one thing that I think makes it a bit easier is that we are dealing with with both sides. So Dr. McAdams mentioned earlier tonight that it, that the um, implants aren't quite as natural looking, um, but at least when we're doing with both sides, we we can match. So we're not trying to match a natural breast on one side to a reconstruction on the other. Um, so that does make a, a difference. I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. Um, Dr. LeBlanc or Williams. Yeah, Dr. LeBlanc, would you um, would you talk maybe address um, sort of the pros and cons of uh, maybe you choosing your own tissue as someone in this category versus uh, choosing implants as Dr. Wheelock um, brought up? Yeah, I mean, I, I think as far as the cons consultations go, I try to, one, have enough time so that we can talk about all the options and really have a good discussion so the patient comes in with maybe they're well-informed, not well-informed, so I try to get an idea of where they are and then try to give them the whole gamut of what typically happens in breast reconstruction. And then going from there, I, I get a good idea of where they're going. So sometimes people will come in and really have a good idea of what they want. They have a friend, they have a family member that got this and then therefore they might want to use their own tissue. And then others, and, and I see a fair amount of siblings where uh, their, their, their sister had a uh, own tissue operation in Toronto, but they're interested in implants and vice versa. So it really varies. And I think really getting to know my patients, really uh, get them to uh, tell me what they know about the reconstruction, give them the, the options, and then we decide together. The, good, the positive thing is there's time on our side. So I think if you have a genetic mutation, you're young, a lot of my patients in that scenario are not rushing into surgery. And I think uh, some of my patients that are diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, time is of the essence and we're moving faster than maybe we would want to. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, um, so, so when you get a young woman that comes in who is thinking about having this major surgery, um, uh, there's, there are a lot of different considerations, uh, clearly, but a couple of them might be um, future pregnancies and breastfeeding and, and um, that kind of thing. And uh, Aletta, you may want to jump in here as well. I'm sure that comes up when people are trying to decide whether to have a prophylactic mastectomy or not. And for us, it may uh, affect whether we want to use abdominal tissue, for example, if they're planning to have, have babies. Um, any thoughts on that, the panelists? 
definitely age does play into the type of breast reconstruction that people consider. I, in our clinic here, we tend to find that the younger people are more interested in implants because they want to preserve their stomach muscles if they're going to still have kids and little kids and have to be lifting them and, and things like that. Um, and I think it usually tends to be the, um, the slightly older carriers, maybe like in their later 40s and beyond, that their kids are grown up that are more doing the um, autologous type reconstruction. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to jump in for a second. I would, I, I would agree. I find similar in my practice. And one thing that I, we were chatting about earlier is, you know, it can be so stressful to try and pick, you know, what you want to do, what, what reconstruction is going to be the perfect one and to know whether you'll have some of these problems with capsular contracture or not. And, um, and I was, you know, I, I try and reassure people that if you choose implants because it's the best decision for you at that point, um, that you can change your mind down the road. So you may, you want to make the best decision at that stage, but if in 15 years you have trouble with capsular contraction, you want to use your abdominal tissue, your kids are older, um, then that is still an option. And uh, but something I think is takes a bit of weight off in the moment as well. Great point, great point. Um, uh, there's a question here that uh, is, uh, fits in with the next topic I wanted to bring up. With uh, So the question is, with testing becoming more available, has there been a spike in this type of preventative surgery and are wait times typically months or years? And and the, the second part of that question um, for, the, for the reconstructive surgeons anyway, it would be how do we triage or prioritize these folks in our wait lists? compared to the people who have already had mastectomies perhaps and have no breasts or the people who have uh, active cancer. Any thoughts on that? Dr. LeBlanc, how do you, uh, how do you fit these folks into your uh, triage system? Yeah, and I think to answer the first part, I mean, being in practice for 10 years now, I think it's a bigger part of our practice. So I think when I trained 15 or 20 years ago, whenever that was, there probably wasn't that many cases and nowadays i think this very much part of our practice so i treat those patients very similar as far as the wait time goes so uh, a lot of my delayed reconstruction where the cancer has been treated and then they're waiting for reconstruction would go on my list uh, and then a lot of my prophylactic patients would be on the very similar list so they're prioritized in that fashion uh, mm -hmm. there are a lot of surgeries that I do for trauma, for emergencies, and therefore that does prolong uh, some of the other surgeries that we do. But uh, I think as far as the breast reconstruction part of my practice, uh, they're prioritized no different than uh, the rest of them. Um, and we try to get to them in a timely fashion. Uh, brings up another another topic as well, maybe Dr. Wheelock. Uh, can you discuss the sort of pros and cons of uh, immediate versus delayed reconstruction in this uh, population? And certainly, you know, it's, um, it's interesting. I think the, you know, most commonly, I probably see immediate reconstruction in these um, patients, and it's partially because we don't have that, that pressure of having a tumor that needs to come off and that needs to be dealt with before you can consider reconstruction. So, um, so most times I feel that we do go on and do immediate reconstructions. Main reason being that that preserves the skin envelope of the breast. So we get a better um, cosmetic result, uh, usually if we use our own tissue, but um, it's certainly not without problems. Um, you know, we can have skin um, uh, mastectomy, so your your breast skin flap, we can have problems with that healing that can lead to complications. And, um, and we can also have, uh, you know, issues with um, coordinating with the surgeon. So sometimes that can take a little bit longer. Um, you know, it, having a delayed reconstruction is still an option. So if a woman has um, her mastectomy for uh, risk reduction, decides that she doesn't want a reconstruction at that point, I think I am, you know, all of us would support that decision. And if down the road, you become interested in a reconstruction, that's an option. But uh, you know, I noticed one, one question that was looking at, um, you know, what, what puts people at risk for infections? And it's, um, that I think that's a hard question for any of us to answer. There are certainly some um, risk factors like um, increased weight or smoking or radiation, but at the end of the day, um, these can have, you know, Breast reconstruction is fraught with, um, you know, 
infections, especially trouble healing, and um, and it, it's not always a an easy journey. That that's a um, that's a great point. And the more complex uh, or the more sophisticated breast reconstruction gets, the more um, the more we see some of these complications. But when it works out, we all enjoy really um, really high quality results. And um, to that point, uh, can we talk about nipple sparing? Uh, for a minute. Um, so one of the things I think that's different in this population compared to people who may have cancer uh, already and maybe a tumor around their nipple that would preclude them from this type of uh, surgery, uh, a lot of the BRCA positive folks might be candidates for uh, nipple sparing mastectomy. Um, Aletta, do you, do you have any thoughts on whether that's a safe option for this population? Yeah, we have actually studied that and we found you are leaving a little bit extra tissue behind. You just have to, in practice, a little bit under the nipple and things. So there are some ducts and, and things left behind that could develop cancer. But we actually studied this and we found you're leaving a little bit of extra risk, but still around 90% of the risk goes away. So still, or maybe even better than that. It's not, a, you're leaving just a little bit extra risk and still, you're taking away most of it. So it's still way better to do that than to do nothing and keep both your breasts. <laughs> right. So it's a very, still very effective at risk reduction. Okay, uh, Dr. Want, Le sorry. Thorough, oh, I was just gonna finish and say, if you wanna do the most to take away almost all of the risk that you can, then don't leave your nipples, but it's still pretty good. <laughs> okay, excellent. So uh, for Dr. LeBlanc and, and Wheelock, um, uh, we all know that not every candidate is a good candidate for nipple sparing, even if they don't currently have cancer. So um, could one or both of you maybe comment on, on some of the fact the things we would consider uh, before we'd offer that to a patient? Uh, yeah, I'll comment. Uh, I, I think the most obvious one was uh, that if, if you were there for the presentation of Sheena McAdam at the very start is that if the nipple's in a good position to start off, then you can probably uh, deliver a very satisfactory result. If your nipple is displaced uh, because you have large breasts and after pregnancies and, and for different issues, then it's very difficult to uh, preserve that nipple uh, other than doing a free nipple graft, which is a whole other issue. But uh, I would think for the most part, the great patients or the great candidates for nipple sparing are they smaller breasts uh, that we see. So it's not everybody that's a candidate. And uh, I think when we discuss them, I think it's an important topic to discuss with both the, your oncological surgeon, so your general surgeon, I think with your plastic surgeon. So I, I would bring up that uh, discussion at the consultation. Good, yeah, great, great. I might just add a little bit to that. I think there are some surgeons that will try and move the, you know, if they have a nipple that's saying really low on the breast, so toward at the bottom of the breast, um, some will try and move. I think that move the nipple at the same time. That's, that's not something that I've um, felt comfortable doing. So I think it really depends on the plastic surgeon, their general surgeon, and the degree of um, what, what they can kind of accomplish together. So it's probably something that would be really important to discuss with individual surgeons. So not, you know, for me, if the nipple is pointing towards the floor, um, it's probably not a good candidate for a nipple sparing, um, but important to discuss with each surgeon. It'll still be pointing at the floor after the reconstruction. <laughs> in other words. Uh, there's a question uh, on this topic. Uh, can you talk about nipple sparing reconstruction? Does this save any sensation or is it the same as the full mastectomy? And, and I'll just uh, tackle that and you guys can chime in if you want. Um, uh, my experience is that you lose any erogenous or, or nipple type sensation, of course, uh, because the nerves are, are uh, sacrificed as part of the mastectomy. However, we know that over a number of months following mastectomy, people do get sensation back in the breast mound to touch at least, and we often have to put uh, local anesthetic in for nipple reconstruction. So at some point, you should get some level of sensation, basic sensation back in the nipple. Is that, is that a consistent experience with the other panelists? Yeah, I think it varies a little bit. I, I certainly would say um, go into it with low expectations and, and maybe you'll find that there's some, but um, I would not expect a erogenous sensation, as you said. No. No. 
they certainly it, they look good, but they they're not functional. There's a couple of questions here about uh, aesthetic flat closures. If people want to have prophylactic uh, mastectomies, um, now going flat has certainly uh, it's been in the news a little bit, and it's certainly an option for the, the high risk patients as well. Uh, people who don't want extra surgery or if there's a wait time associated with, with getting a reconstruction and they're worried about the risk of developing cancer. And um, here in Halifax, there was a lady profiled maybe a month ago who looked great and she was on the beach with her uh, flat top and she had a beautiful, beautiful mastectomy closure and, and looked really great. Um, and one of the questions is here, do anybody, do, or do certain surgeons um, uh, train in this sort of thing? And it's, to my mind, it's more of a, uh, something that the general surgeons or the surgical oncologists would address. And we don't typically get involved in closing mastectomies, but uh, any other thoughts from the panelists on that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to jump in quickly. And I, you know, I, I think, I totally support people who don't want reconstruction. It's certainly not the right thing for everyone. Um, you know, I, I think the big issue with the, the aesthetic flat closures is it, it very much depends on each woman's um, body shape as they come into it. So um, if you have, um, you know, a little bit of looser skin or extra, um, extra skin under your arm, um, that is very noticeable after a mastectomy. And, um, and it's, it's not covered within um, the traditional uh, excision of that is not part of the traditional mastectomy and it's not part of what is is done sort of um, by Medicare. So I think that for people who um, who have fairly flat skin underneath their arm that they can have um, a, a traditional mastectomy with, you know, good attention paid to the closure, which I think most um, most general surgeons try and do and have a, a really nice result. Um, but if you do have extra skin there, then then you probably aren't going to be as happy. And um, and it's not something that is um, that is typically insured. Is that fair? You say? Yep. Great. Um, great points. And and uh, like like you guys, I've seen some really great looking uh, chests after mastectomies and some that look really deformed. And it's really depends a lot not just on your disease, but on um, your body habitus. And I, yeah, and I think it's worth it if you have a mastectomy defect that you're not happy with. I think I've seen a bunch of patients that thought they were seeing me for their reconstruction and we go down and start talking about reconstruction and they're really there for us to revise their scars or do a small revision and they can move on with their lives. So uh, we've had uh, our fair share of consults where patients are just unhappy with what we left behind and we see, want, want to know what we can do to take it Good. Um, another question, a uh, uh, similar talk. We were talking about sensation to nipples. Um, are there any techniques to preserve the nerves during mastectomy? And uh, I attended a great session on this at microsurgery conference last January. I think it was the last conference I'll be to in a while. But um, there's certainly, it's trending. It's not easy and it, doesn't lead to perfect results and it's but it's gaining a lot of at least social media attention in the u.s and um i don't think it i haven't been convinced that it leads to excellent sensation and it can be there can be complications uh you need nerve grafts and it extends the time required for the surgery but it's um, something that people are talking about margie or marty anything uh no i'd say just just to echo what you said, I don't think it's commonly done and certainly something to watch, I guess, over the next number of years and see if it if it becomes commonplace or just goes by the wayside. And I guess we'll see. Yeah, it may be a bit of a fad that, that burns out because it's not that great, but or it may be something that becomes commonplace. Great comment. Um, back to Aletta for a sec. There's a couple of questions here about uh, check uh, two positive. That's a new one to me, I have to confess. So. Um, uh, there were two different questions about check two positive. I'll just read you one of them. Um, 28 year old patient, would it be beneficial to have a prophylactic nipple sparing mastectomy in that case? So check two is a moderate risk breast cancer gene. So the, the level of breast cancer risk is not as high typically as for BRCA one and two. Now, and 
even within check two, there's one particular mutation that has even lower risk than most of the other check two mutations. But generally speaking, your risk, instead of being up to around 70% for that 28 year old, if she had BRCA one or two, could be more in the range of 25 to maybe up to 40, sort of that kind of range. Um, so it is increased, but there at that level, um, certainly I think it's not unreasonable to consider, but it's not quite as strongly pushed, like in that moderate risk category that you necessarily have to do risk reduction. Family history probably plays into that a little bit, the person's own experience and how they feel about it and how anxious they are. If you're worrying about getting breast cancer every single day, all the time, you probably may end up doing better <laughs> by having a risk reducing surgery. But if you're someone who feels okay about the risk and is happy with doing high risk monitoring, they can get MRIs regularly, then they could also go that route. So it's, it's just not quite as clear cut. Okay, good. Uh, another sort of related question, uh, I'll just read it here. Is it ultimately up to the patient to decide whether they want a prophylactic mastectomy or other cases when the surgeon would not support it? So. So I think that, um, I think for some of the more clear cut genetic markers, BRCA one and two, it's probably not questioned, I would think. Um, maybe a more extensive discussion when the risk isn't quite as clear like the check uh, situation. And then uh, with, with a strong family history and no genetic markers that have been uh, detected, uh, maybe a more thorough discussion. Um, any other thoughts from anybody else on how that goes? It's really a discussion that I defer to the general surgeon or the surgical oncologist to determine whether a prophylactic mastectomy and the geneticist to figure out whether a prophylactic mastectomy is in order. And by the time we see the folks to to talk about um, reconstruction, that decision's often already uh, addressed to some degree. Um, yeah. Thoughts on that? I mean, I I'd agree with that. And I think um, I really like in my mind, you really want to make the right decision and with all the information you can. So talking about with the genetic system, with the general surgeon, you know, the risks of and the complications with reconstruction are, are double if you do both sides. So um, and and we know that doing the uh, using the the autologous tissue, so using your, your belly to move up, that we do see more complaints of, of tightness through the stomach muscles after, um, and more so in cases where we use both sides instead of just one. Mm -hmm. So it's certainly, it's. I, I don't push people. If it's the right decision for you, then I think it's the right thing to do. And we go ahead and we write reconstruct both sides, but um, but it's not, I, you know, I think it really, you want it to be the right thing would be my sense. Yeah. I just so, might add to it's, it, it may be becoming, if a person has a, hereditary genetic mutation, it is a lot easier to get the, the risk reducing surgery justified and for that to be funded. Um, I think and it could, this could vary again by province, but I know that sometimes if they don't have a mutation, the province is getting a little more careful about what they'll pay for and what they won't. So um, it's, it's not always that the patient can just say, I want this. <laughs> Yeah. Um, now, if you can show that, you know, you still have a quite a high level of risk, um, then it may still, it may still be possible. I'm just throwing that out there that it's, it's not always possible. Yeah, I think that's consistent in uh, Nova Scotia, at least as well, you have to have uh, some sort of proof that it's a worthwhile uh, endeavor yes, exactly. with some evidence. Yeah. Um, couple of questions here. Uh, one for you, Dr. LeBlanc. Someone's wondering how is the new belly button made after a, a belly flap breast reconstruction? Um, yeah, so we typically will not uh, get rid of your belly button. So the belly button stays attached to the abdominal wall. Uh, and then when we pull down your skin to close the area where we took the skin and factor reconstruct the breast, we would be able to make a new opening in your skin to deliver that uh, umbilicus that uh, is still attached to your abdominal wall. So uh, I think the majority of breast reconstruction pay, uh, surgeons would be preserving your umbilicus. Uh, sometimes it can get twisted, so I've seen problems with uh, the circulation to it, but uh, it's something that we tend to preserve and uh, get Good. 
Um, Dr. Wheelock, can a surgeon decide to put an implant over the muscle or under the muscle prior to uh, prophylactic bilateral mastectomy, or is this something you have to wait uh, until you're in there to decide? Well, that's a great question. Um, so. Usually, usually <laughs> I try and um, get an idea from uh, from the patient what they want. Uh, when the, when we put it above the muscle, there, uh, at least in my hands, you are more likely to see rippling to see some implant, and you probably need fat grafting, which is tricky because it's not an insured service in Nova Scotia or New Brunswick. Um, so you know, that's, there's some nuances. So I usually try and get an idea before. Sometimes we, we've decided that we want to try and go above the muscle, but maybe I get in and the skin flaps um, don't look quite thick enough. I'm worried about them. And usually in that case, um, I may try and just use a, I may try and use an expander. So a, that temporary device that I can stretch out later and still put it above the muscle. But every once in a while, I'll transition, I'll put it under the muscle just because I think it's safer. It gives a bit more, um, a bit more uh, protection between the implant and the skin flap. Um, yeah. Dr. LeBlanc, anything to add to that? Similar, similar approach? And the techniques are de developing and there's a lot of, I wouldn't say advertising, but a lot of talk about those different techniques. And I think just having a, a, a discussion with the patients, what the advantages and disadvantages are, and there's probably some advantages and then there's probably some disadvantages. And I think uh, on many occasions, uh, it's going to depend on how healthy your skin is after you've had your mastectomies. And uh, that uh, might limit what can be done. Uh, there's no doubt there's a big of a bit a bit more expense to those cases if you use that ADM that they've talked about uh, it tends to be a very expensive material so I think if uh, across Canada we all decide to start doing that particular operation where the implants in the front of your muscle and we're all using ADM then uh, I, I think we'd have to worry about uh, whether the breast reconstruction of that type would be a, an insured service uh, long term Good. You brought up a, a topic that came up in an earlier question I was going to um, address uh, separately, but um, the cost of alloderm is a, is a concern in some hospitals. I think there's variability in which hospitals have relatively easy access to it and, and those and some don't. And, and it doesn't, doesn't seem to be any pattern that I can uh, discern on that. Uh, uh, but your point is good, which is that it's a very expensive um, product and we, we try to use it for the people who I think would benefit from it most, uh, lessening the um, number of stages perhaps they need for the reconstruction or enhancing the results. So we have to, like with everything in healthcare, be, be good stewards of the, of the system and go from there. Uh, another good question here. How far back has COVID pushed the wait list for Dieppe flap reconstructions? I know we didn't do any in Halifax from um, April till August, just to try to minimize the, the inpatient stays. Uh, and then we've started again, but uh, I'm sure across the country, it's been similar. Have you guys heard or do you know anything? Yeah, I'm not sure, but I think I think you're probably right. I suspect that's pushed everything back, and it's hard to know what's going to happen in the coming months as well. Um, if there's a if there's a push to keep beds open again, but hopefully they'll keep keep the depths flowing. So yeah, yes. Um, Aletta, one for you. Uh, this uh, attendee has a daughter who's 24 years old, and I guess the mom has BRCA1. What age is right for the daughter to go be tested? Sounds like she's around the age that we would typically suggest that women go and get genetic testing. Usually we feel like 25 is around mm -hmm. the right age. You're a little more settled in your life and ready to hear that information. It depends if the daughter really is ready herself. Um, certainly I would say by age 30, we start getting anxious that the person find out whether or not they're at high risk or if they really don't want testing, then start getting breast MRIs at 30. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. to make sure if they happen to get something, it's caught early. Very good. Um, another question. How common is it for the flaps to die in a Dieppe operation? Well, in the literature, <laughs> we usually quote about three to 5% or less. And it uh, seems like the rates keep going down with better experience and but every once in a while you get caught out like I did this week but anyway 
it's uh, it happens sometimes and sometimes and it's mostly unpredictable um and um and you always have that discussion up front with your patients so they know there's a risk and you um have a backup plan so that if if the you know dreaded complication does happen then you you have a plan that you've talked about and it's acceptable because it is something that just happens once in a while uh, but around i usually say about five percent but it's less than that uh don't smoke. yeah don't smoke <laughs> um good someone's wondering if you can get an implant and then do a diep later and dr wheelock you talked about that earlier that if you're not quite ready to make a decision on having a big invasive operation with the recovery there's no shame in having a tissue expander and implant placed and if you like it great if you don't then you haven't burned any bridges and you can have a have the more uh, extensive and perhaps lifelong um, operation done later, maybe once you had kids or once you've had a chance to recover and, and your, life is, is in, your life is in a better um, place for such, a, such an investment. Uh, one for Aletta here. Aletta, you mentioned that genetic testing can be paid for by patient. How do I get more information about this? This patient lives in PEI and they're waiting for a, a, a year for testing out of Halifax. Um, is there any website or anything that we could direct somebody to? Or? Yeah, there's, in terms of the, there's a number of really good companies out there. I first want to say that. Um, I'm just going to mention two options that are just more affordable. Um, and that's the only reason I'm mentioning them because they're cheaper. One is here at Women's College Hospital, we're doing something called the Screen Project, where it is meant for any Canadian adult who wants to just pay for testing. Um, it's 250 US dollars. It's done on a saliva sample, which is it's a kit sent to your house. Um, and you can just order it yourself online. They start off with BRCA1 and 2 testing, but once you get that result, you can actually ask for more genes and you end up getting an additional 43 genes all for the same price. So it's a 45 gene test uh, for common hereditary breast and ovarian and colon cancer genes. And so it's quite good. If something is significant is found on the test, you are called by the study genetic counselor. Um, and so you're not just left with this information and they'll make sure you get to a good genetics clinic where you are. So that's a really good option. And it's probably the cheapest shipping is included. There's another company called Color Genomics. Um, through the screen project, the testing's done at Invite in the States. Color Genomics has their own lab also in the States. The only thing, um, they do a, also a similar 30 gene hereditary cancer and heart disease panel and some markers for how you metabolize medications. It's a similar price, but you have to pay shipping and shipping in Canada is around, I think, 70 US dollars on top of it. So right. these are both things you can order yourself online. You just go, they send you a saliva kit. And in both cases, if something is found, you get a genetic counselor. to talk. Excellent. Uh, good question here about uh, some details about uh, DEP reconstruction for uh, Dr. Wheelock and LeBlanc. I can jump in on this one. So I'll just read it out. Uh, someone's having a prophylactic mastectomy, skin sparing and nipple sparing with DEP reconstruction. Uh, the understanding is that the skin of the flap is discarded and only the fat and vessels are kept. Is that right? So sometimes if you're burying it, yes. Or do surgeons always leave paddles below the breast. So if you look at the pictures and then some of the talks tonight, you see the, the patched uh, skin, uh, skin patches, skin paddles. Um, can we expect similar cosmetic results with the DEP instead of implants sort of related to that? Any comments on that? Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, there probably is some provider preference, um, but I would, I would typically, and I think most surgeons would leave some degree of skin paddle. Um, that just helps us monitor in those first few days so that we know early if there's a problem, because that's certainly the easiest way is we see a, a change in the color of the skin, and then we can try and catch things early and fix it. Um, typically what I would do is I'd leave it there, but then I can go back once you're healed and everything looks good and I can take that skin paddle out. So it's a, it's a temporary thing. Um, 
you know, and I would say it's actually been helpful to me a couple of times because the blood supply has to make it all the way from the top of the breast down to that sort of fold at the bottom of your breast. And I have had times where some of the breast skin has died and having that bit of extra skin pile at the bottom has helped me and I've ended up leaving it because I needed it for the skin. So not as good from a cosmetic perspective as if I can take it out. Um, but if I need it in a pinch, then I will use it. So. I'll have that discussion with patients and then we decide together. I think most of the time and most surgeons would prefer having a bit of skin there. And just to add to that, that skin can be removed with just a bit of freezing. So you don't have to go to sleep most of the time. I, uh, I think most of us can take out the skin with a bit of freezing in our minor procedure room. So I would say uh, if you don't leave too much skin, it's easy to take out uh, under local anesthesia. Probably just as easy as going to your dentist. So it's like <laughs> Dr. Williams, what's your thought on the cosmetic appearance between the DEPS and the implant? Oh, you get me on the spot now. <laughs> I think uh, I think like um, some of your comments earlier, uh, the other panelists' comments. Uh, so much of it depends on um, what your body is like when you start. And there's no question in my mind that if you have larger breasts and a larger body frame, the implants are probably not going to be as satisfying as your own tissue because we're limited. Um, as you guys know, to the size of implants that are available. And I believe in Canada, the largest implant we can get is about 800 cc's. And sometimes uh, a large um, framed person might have a breast volume that's double that. And to have a breast that looks appropriately proportioned to your frame, um, it, it's just really hard to achieve that with implants alone. Uh, now, a uh, bilateral DAP reconstruction is certainly hard on the body and a big investment, but, um, but it's probably a superior uh, outcome in the long run. Now, for the thinner, uh, smaller-breasted patient, I think implants have an excellent, especially in a nipple-sparing immediate reconstruction, uh, pre-pectoral, with no animation deformity sort of situation, you can't beat it. They look, they look so good and um, there's no scars anywhere else. And, and uh, you know, I think, I think you guys said it er well earlier, which is uh, when you talked about how we can customize all the options that are available to what is best for any individual patient's situation. And I think it really comes down to that, but, but my earlier comments are kind of my bias on that. Good. Uh, let's see. I see somebody. I see somebody popped up. Who's that? Perry. We'll be running out of time. Hi, Perry, we out of time. Okay. Let me see if there's any any other questions we want to try. Um, Aletta, I saw something here about a different type of mutation. I want to ask you about if I can find it. Where'd that go? Sorry, I can't find that question. Bard one. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Bard one. Bard yes. one. Had one mastectomy, I think, if I can find the text of that question. Had one mastectomy, had uh, over, uh, oophorectomy. Um, should they have... Oh, there it is. Bard one. Do you know much about it? Do you recommend prophylactic mastectomy on the other side after having cancer already on one side, it looks like? Um, that one's a little more trip, uh, tricky. It's one that we haven't got as much data on, though there, so we're not quite as clear about the level, even of, for someone who just is born with a BARD1 mutation, how much their chances in the first place of getting breast cancer. And then there's the risk of a second breast cancer. We certainly don't know. So for BRCA1 and 2, we've been studying them long enough and we know that the contralateral breast cancer risk is quite high and it's definitely worth considering doing both. Um, and that BRCA1 or 2 mutation carriers serve, have a longer uh, breast cancer-free survival if they do both, as opposed to just one if they have breast cancer. We really don't know for these other genes. The only, so normally we wouldn't necessarily, it, it's a bit more patient choice when it comes to that. The one little caveat around that is BARD1 is a little more likely to have triple negative breast cancers, which are a more aggressive kind that you wouldn't really want to get. So there's different things to weigh up. Yeah. Also family history, we just, it's not, a, it's not a yes, 
yes talk no to your answer. counselor yes <laughs> um, okay how they feel about it again right how they feel about their level of risk um, there's a couple other good questions here. I'm going to try to just to get through them. We're in, running a little low on time. Um, for uh, breast reconstruction, what is your preference for somebody who has had radiation? So, so, it's, so it is possible that someone's had radiation from a lumpectomy um, and then finds out they're gene positive. So same situation as, as other folks. So, and you may be looking at a still a bilateral um, uh, mastectomy and reconstruction situation. Uh, Dr. LeBlanc or Wheelock, um, someone, so let's say someone had radiation. I'm going to just put it out there that it's after a lumpectomy, say 10 years ago, and now they're showing up with um, BRCA positive. They want prophylactic mastectomies. What are their reconstruction um, uh, sort of uh, thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, um, that's a really tough one, I think, to some extent. <laughs> can, you can jump in. But um, but you know, it really depends on, it depends on where the lumpectomy was. Some women have lumpectomies and the breast shape is still really natural. Some women actually, uh, their breast shape is really altered um, or it's a lot smaller. Um, I, I certainly, I get nervous if there's been radiation using a lot of alloderm. Um, so the prepectoral for me is probably not a great option in this case. I just don't find that the alloderm, it, it, becomes part of you as well. Um, and that it's tricky. You may find some surgeons would feel otherwise. It's just in my experience, I've had more trouble with that. So, um, so I would probably slightly alter my techniques or discuss different techniques or, or maybe using your own tissue might make more sense or, um, or one that wasn't mentioned tonight using some skin and muscle from your back. So I, I would say that this is one where it really depends on the individual um, and, and sort of what your goals are, what changes you had after the lumpectomy. Uh, good comments. And I'll just, um, this patient has made a follow-up. So it, how does that change if you've already had a mastectomy? And I'll, I'll throw out that um, for us, I think tissue expansion as an option would be very, very difficult to achieve any kind of a meaningful breast mound in that case. And you're probably looking at one of the autogenous or your own tissue options um, uh, primarily. Um, if we have time for one more question, are we going to get kicked out? Uh, what starts? What happens when you start aging with implants, Dr. LeBlanc? How long do implants last? And what age would you no longer continue to replace the implants? I plan to live to at least 100. I would like to have boobs for most of that time. Yeah, and then we, we see a lot of patients, and I have some in their 90s, and they still have implants, and some have uh, even leaked silicone, and they're still doing well, no problems, and we have none, nothing. Uh, there's people that have uh, problems with their implants uh, a week after surgery. So I think there's a, there's a limit probably to some of those uh, devices that we put in people. And we really don't know the silicone implants came on the market in 2006. So we're about uh, 14 years into it and that's too early to tell. Uh, and I think uh, if I was gonna talk to a lot of my younger patient population that are going prophylactic, uh, I bet you that our implants are not gonna, not, not gonna last till you're 100. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. So I bet you're gonna need another surgery at some point. Again, those surgeries are short, easy, quick, uh, so I wouldn't get too worried about that. But I think if you're looking for one final surgery and no more ever surgeries, that's why we do the DF flaps and things like that. Because if that works, then you're done for life and you hopefully don't need anything. Uh, if you put an implant in a 20, 30 year old, I just don't think that we're not gonna do a further surgery uh, until you're hundred years old. Maybe keep me posted. So uh, great. So you'll, you will need more surgeries in your lifetime if you have implants, but uh, I'll, I'll throw out that those uh, surgeries are day surgeries and if it's to replace a ruptured implant or something, it's not, not that big a deal. Okay, um, well, I'm gonna wrap this up then. I think we're getting ready for the next session. Look, I'd like to thank the panelists. Uh, I learned a lot from you, Aletta, and uh, to my colleagues in Halifax, thanks for joining and for sharing all that great information. And to the audience, uh, really, uh, what a lot of great questions that uh, really stimulated us and challenged us a little bit and uh, really enjoyed the discussion. So thank you.